So my name is Andrew Jack. I'm one of the complex spine surgeons and peripheral nerve surgeons up in uh, Edmonton, Alberta, Canada. And unfortunately, as we were talking about earlier, it's not quite that sunny and nice out now, but. If I can just advance here, there we go. And so I was fortunate enough to do my fellowship as uh, Dr. Oskirin was saying a couple of years ago uh, in Seattle with the group there. And I'm gonna be talking about uh, or presenting a case on traumatic spinal cord injury and discussing some of the physiological effects of, uh, of the trauma on uh, the spinal cord and resultant um, systemic effects, as well as discussing some of the more nuanced surgical decision-making uh, pertaining to the case. And so this was a, uh, a young patient that we saw uh, a little while ago, 31 year old male involved in an MVC head on. Uh, he was restrained and belted in uh, the rear seat, but intoxicated, uh, otherwise healthy. And he was awake and alert uh, at the scene. Uh, by the time he was brought into the emergency department, uh, although a febrile, he was a little bit hypotensive and, and mildly bradycardic there. Uh, respiratory rate stable and satting well, GCS of 15. So this is his, uh, his Asia neurological exam. You can see that uh, at the bottom there, he was an Asia A, uh, approximately a C6 neurological level with a very small area of uh, or zone of partial preservation. And so I'll just talk about some of the investigations then that are pertinent to this case. Uh, a trauma patient, obviously he'd undergone uh, extensive workup looking for other uh, injuries, CT chest, abdomen and pelvis, CT head. Uh, but he was, uh, his, his injuries were isolated to his uh, cervical spinal cord. And so uh, investigations sailing to this case, then MRI, uh, CT looking for bony injury, uh, CTA uh, looking for vertebral artery abnormalities, dissections and injury. Um, which have their own indications as well, which we can talk about a little bit later on if you guys like. Uh, and then obviously a preoperative and, and trauma panel workup for him as well. And so I have his uh, CT here, if I can go through it here. And so just moving through the sagittal cuts there, you can see then uh, this was the C6-7 level. Uh, you can see that he's fractured his superior articulating process of C7, as well as then split his, his uh, lateral mass and facet on that side and then jumped it. And then going through, you can see that he's translated forward in keeping with a flexion distraction type injury, as well as because of that, uh, ended up with almost a teardrop like fracture from that flexion compression uh, mechanism. And then going to the other side, He's again jumped his facet there. And so a CTA was done, as I mentioned, but uh, there was no vertebral artery injury. So there's a couple of different classification systems uh, that are more widely used and recognized. This is the ESLIC system, uh, breaking up these injuries into injury morphology. He had a translational type injury. Uh, integrity of the discal ligamentous complex, obviously disrupted. Uh, he was a complete cord injury with ongoing cord compression. So I don't think anybody's going to argue the need for operative fixation and fusion in this case. And then this is one of the more recent classification systems that's come out, uh, the AO spine subaxial classification system. Uh, and in keeping with some of their other classification systems, breaking uh, these injuries down into types A, B, and C. And so this gentleman had a, uh, a primary injury, a C, a translational type injury at 6'7". Uh, and then secondary injury, he had uh, that wedge compression type injury, almost a teardrop fracture fragment uh, being displaced anteriorly. Modifiers, he had bought bilateral facet injuries on both sides. And then on the right-hand side of the screen, uh, you can kind of see the algorithm by which you go through for classifying these patients. Uh, with At the bottom right there, there are neurological modifiers, so complete cord injury and ongoing cord compression, which I mentioned. The one thing that's a little bit unique about this classification system, which uh, I quite like, is it, it also adds in uh, other potential systemic modifiers as well. For example, whether or not there's a vertebral artery uh, abnormality or injury, as well as metabolic bone diseases such as OPLL, AS, for example, whether or not there's a large critical disc herniation, which 
uh, may also help tip your hat one way or the other in terms of management. And so initial management uh, for this patient, obviously uh, maintaining spine precautions on him. Uh, I think it was uh, Dr. Andrew Daly was talking about uh, the need really for these patients to maintain absolute vigilance at all times, especially when intubating, uh, whether in the emergency department setting or whether in the OR, ensuring that uh, you're doing it in a safe fashion, maintaining uh, inline uh, cervical stability or fiber optic awake intubation, uh, as well as oxygenating these patients to avoid any uh, secondary hypoxic injuries to the cord. Uh, and then also in the setting of this case, he had come in somewhat hypotensive. So after initial fluid resuscitation, making sure that uh, you increase their MAP with, uh, with ionotropes or, or vasopressors. And then I, I mentioned reduction here. Uh, this is gonna be a little bit more surgeon dependent and, and locale dependent, whether or not that's done uh, in a closed fashion preoperatively or uh, just taking them straight to the OR for an open reduction and uh, fixation fusion. And then finally, uh, an option, uh, albeit probably beyond the scope of this talk, is the, is the role of steroids, uh, a bit of controversy, and probably somewhat surgeon-dependent as well as institution-dependent. And so then definitive management, uh, as I was kind of alluding to earlier, uh, reduction, open versus closed, which then plays a role as to whether or not uh, it, you're going to take them for uh, direct decompression immediately or whether or not you can get them indirectly decompressed somewhat through a closed reduction and then obviously definitive management in the way of fixation and fusion. And again, a little bit of uh, debate as to what sort of injury morphologies uh, demand anterior versus posterior versus circumferential fixation. And so for this patient, he had arrived in the middle of the night uh, as well as in a little bit of neurogenic shock. And so what we had done was decided to stabilize him first hemodynamically as well as put him in uh, traction, closed reduction, uh, to try and get him uh, indirectly decompressed as fast as possible. And what we had done, as you can see, first with 20 pounds of traction, uh, not reduced, obviously, going up to 35, still not reduced, and 55, it's certainly starting to distract and come back, but not there yet. And so what we did uh, was, it, it's difficult to see here, but we just did a uh, live fluoroscopy and uh, manually reduced him ourselves. And then afterwards you can see, uh, immediately took him to the MR suite. And you can see that we've got him quite a bit uh, more reduced there with uh, much less compression on the spinal cord. Uh, unfortunately, quite an extensive spinal cord injury uh, as shown there on the, uh, the far right. And then uh, first thing the next morning, taking them for definitive management in the way of uh, circumferential fixation and fusion. And so went from the front and did a uh, corpectomy or partial corpectomy of that C6 level, putting on our, our plate and then uh, turning him prone and doing a, a posterior instrumented fusion. So I'd just like to thank everybody for allowing me this opportunity to present this case discussing spinal cord injury management, both initial and definitive. Um, I think we have reasonably good evidence now showing that uh, for operative patients or for these patients, we should really be trying to, to decompress them and uh, operatively and fix them as soon as safely possible. And that there are several classification systems out there. Uh, the ESLIC system, one of the more commonly used ones as well as uh, the more recent AO spine uh, subaxial classification system. Dr. Jack, that was outstanding. There's a quick question here in the uh, chat. Um, the closed reduction, is that done in the operating room or is that done in the emergency room or in the intensive care unit? Where do you do the closed reduction? Uh, so for this, so typically our, our institution is a little bit unique. Uh, one of my partners, uh, he actually, he invented and fabricated an MR compatible spine board. And so what we'll often do with these patients uh, is we'll put them on the spine board and we'll reduce them under MR. Um, if it's, for example, in the middle of the night and we can go and shoot sagittal T2s and increase the weight in real time, looking at them come back and reduce. Now that being said, um, if we're not able to get them reduced, I think it is important to get them decompressed as quickly as possible, as I was mentioning. So we'll take them straight to the OR in that case.